real real legit. It's slick, dude. It even gives me like little sound effects things. Like I could like have a crowd like clap in the background and do shit like that as we do this. What a production. I, is, I, know. I don't know if I'm worthy of this. It's unbelievable. <laughs> All right. Well, we are here live with Jordan Shallow. Jordan Van, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and just uh, you know, chat about picking things up and putting them back down with me. Pleasure, man. So I feel like this has been a long time in the making. It has. It like has a lot like of a... email chains and just back and forth. Old email chains. Yeah, like yeah. I think the email chain I kicked back up here was from like 2020 or something along those lines. Which is hilarious. We landed on probably the most inconvenient time zone for both of us to be in to actually <laughs> finally make it happen. But it is what it is. It's good, dude. It's good. But uh, let's do this. For, for people listening who maybe don't know who you are, can you give them just a real quick elevator pitch on you? Maybe. Um, okay, let's let's do the Coles notes. Uh, I'm a chiropractor by trade. Uh, I own and operate a few companies kind of in the e-commerce fitness space. Uh, one's sort of like a software company. The other is, uh, I guess, more an education company. Um, I was a competitor. Oh, maybe let's say I still am a competitive powerlifter. So I'm a competitive powerlifter kind of by, by vocation or hobby. Um yeah, I, I I do some strength and conditioning. Uh, some I still practice a little bit on the concierge side. I have like a handful of clients that I work with across a few sports teams in North America, and uh, I currently reside in Dubai. Um, yeah, that's like the super super Coles Notes version of it. So basically, chiropractor, strength coach. Um, did some time in the NCAA. Uh, worked with Stanford University for a bit. Did uh, corporate chiropractic at Apple's world headquarters. Uh, yeah, I own a few businesses. I like lifting weights and talking about lifting weights, and I just figured out a way to do that and still pay my bills. Beautiful. I love it. That's great, man. So I think where I'd love to to kick this conversation off is where did kind of the love for strength and conditioning and the Iron Game start for you? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. No, nah, it's that's man, it seems like a lifetime ago. Um, started with sports, man. I was a... Uh, I was a hockey player growing up in Canada, so I grew up in a town called Windsor, Ontario, which is like a small little border town just opposite Detroit, Michigan. Um, so I played hockey. It was like decently good at a young age and um, started in like really like actual conventional strength and conditioning to just get better at hockey. Before that, I'd never lifted a weight. I had no real inclination to until someone was like, if you really want to kind of take this, your hockey career um, and see what you can make of it, you're probably going to have to try and get like bigger, faster, stronger and all that. So I, uh, I worked with a couple guys when I was younger um, who had played in like the OHL and NHL and things like that. So that's where like dry land training or, you know, as we call it now, probably more just conventional strength and conditioning sort of started. And my only aspiration, my only objective outcome was to get better on the ice. So off season between like age 15, 16, I really started to kind of get after it um, as far as everything strength and conditioning. And then I really sort of enjoyed the is at that age like the seemingly instant progress and i was like holy shit like this is crazy like i <laughs> i re i remember yeah. going from the ninth grade to the 10th grade and i i think i grew like eight inches over the summer and put on like 30 or 40 pounds and i was like if i'm gonna be a superhero like if i keep doing this like i'm gonna be seven <laughs> foot ten and 400 pounds but so that really kind of spiked because everyone I worked with, as you start to, you know, as you stay in the industry long enough, everyone has like a scheme or a system or whatever. And I'm probably no, no better, but it's like in the early days, everyone had like a logic and a reason and it could be flawed and half of it probably was, but it was enough to keep you engaged. You're like, oh, wow. Then, mm -hmm. yeah, so at like 15, I think I read my first like Charles Poliquin article and I started diving into like teen Asian stuff and strength and conditioning oh, yeah. kind of started to meld with like hypertrophy training. And then, you know, as you age out in sports, which happens so quick, you don't even realize that it's coming where it's like, if you're not in the league by like 18, you're like, Oh fuck. Uh, so I ended up playing juniors mm -hmm. in Canada and that's, I mean, obviously you see the writing on the wall. It's like, you can either go to school or you can like muck around in the ECHL or something like that, or the West coast hockey league and try and backdoor it in. So I was like, no, I'm just gonna, go to school and keep training. And by that time I'd really kind of taken a foothold in uh, like hypertrophy style training. I think it was, I, I finished my hockey career at maybe like 245 pounds, which as a goalie was quite big. Um, 
so I just sort of kept on the hypertrophy thing as far as what how I like to train and kept diving into like the anatomy, mm-hmm. biomechanics, sports science, periodization stuff, just really on the side as a hobby. And that hobby, fuck, I don't know, 12, no, how, how old am I? 32, 15, 14 years later is now kind of my career a little bit. So it was really sports that got me into it. Um, it was actually sports that yeah. kind of recapitulated my trajectory into chiropractic. Actually, I had a really good chiropractor that helped me through a few knee injuries. Um, I didn't even know the stigma of like chiropractors being like, they just crack your bones because I never really had that. Um, so that really sent me down the trajectory of that career path more specifically. And I just kind of meld them all together. And that's kind of what I do now. It is funny how many people I think around our general age group that are in any way involved in the strength, conditioning, powerlifting, bodybuilding world can trace back some inkling of interest to those early teen nation days, like the glory days of T nation <laughs> before, well, it, before they've kind of become what they are now, yeah. dude, like there was a stretch there. T nation was the shit. They just dropping dimes, like everything. It was like hard to find, but once your hand was stamped and you got into this forbidden city, like there was no sifting through to find like good information. Like it was all deadly. Early days, elite FTS was mm-hmm. another reference that comes to mind. And, Poliquin's yep. article before it kind of split into Poliquin group and before he started, you know, rest in peace, before he started like selling everyone bajillion of IUs of vitamin D and like a bajillion grams of glutamine <laughs> or whatever the fuck. But um, yeah, it was like, I honestly think it was easier for like our generation because you, there was no real uncertainty. Like the only people, because there was no followings, right? It was all meritocracy. It was like, who's this? This is Joe DeFranco. What does he do? He trains everyone that goes to the NFL. Okay, who's this? Charles Baldwin. What does he do? <laughs> Have you seen the Olympics? All of those people. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, all right, sick. And you're like, who's this? Like, I don't know. He's He's got a hundred million followers. I was like, is that, does that count? Like, what is, how does that rank yeah. next to you? So I think it was easier for us to 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 find principles and find like just critical thinkers because that, if it was the only way to make it. Yeah. I remember finding Eric Cressy on there. Like when I was first kind of like started getting going into strength and conditioning, I was like, hold on. This dude deadlifts 600 pounds, but then he sits around and talks about anatomy and biomechanics and movement and the scapular humeral rhythm and all this other stuff. Cause like the issue I ran into in college was I just got hurt all the damn time. Like traditional strength and conditioning kind of very much broke me. And so I was like, there has to be a better, a better answer, like a better way of approaching this thing of getting as strong and as big and as fast as I can without just perpetually like being hurt all the time. And so that was how I kind of like wound my way in the back door. And I saw Eric Cressy talking about all this stuff. Like, this is very different. It's like, I need to go spend some time with this man. And so, yeah, the very first thing I did, I basically just like bugged him and Pete Dupuis until they gave me an internship in Boston. And like that essentially just like led everything else downhill from there. What a legend. Oh, Cressy's one of a kind. I know he is. He very much is man. But so hypertrophy was kind of like the first love there and then eventually i think it's just like strength sports in general right hypertrophy powerlifting what people have now liked to call like people call it power building now because we have to have like a label and title for pretty much everything yeah. nowadays for whatever it is um but with that style of training i think it's always really interesting to kind of approach this what are some of the big rock things that you think you've carried with you over time with regards to how you approach hypertrophy training? And then what are maybe some of the more nuanced things that have changed for you in like the last one to two years, like things you've updated and changed? Mm, okay. Yeah. Always like a... Yeah. The big rock one is interesting because it's, it's, it's kind of come full circle where I probably train now more like I did when I first started. And it was like, why I ever deviated away from that? It, I've that's like the biggest question mark in my brain is like, why did I get it? Like I, you know, like I said, I was putting on, and obviously, like, you know, the hormones when you're a kid, and and the novelty factor and the novelty stimulus that comes with doing nothing and then doing something, and you know, having like a more competitive environment. You're in high school; it's a fucking just a cesspool. You're just trying to not get beat up and then maybe beat someone up. Ah, this is, fuck, so so confusing. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, 
dude, that's tough. I think in the last couple of years, the thing I've been forced to respect about hypertrophy training is like fatigue management over weeks and load management um, in sessions and being much more um, like, I don't know, again, what are the labels? What, what are people going to cling to? Uh, like being more like almost like RPE based in the way I train rather than being by the book, which mm -hmm. was like, it's tough because when I am actively competing in powerlifting or when I was, when I first started being competitive in powerlifting, it was very much like linear progression percentage based, almost like prelipin esque. And I just had like a, mm -hmm. a, a great training environment. I, you know, I, I learned how to powerlift at boss barbell club at the peak of like Dan green and Andrew Herbert's, you know, domination of the 100 yeah, animal. And, Absolute so, savage. So, so, like I would be the only, there'd be five of us training on a Friday night doing deadlifts and I'd be the only one without multiple world records. So I, all to say it's, <laughs> living out of a suitcase for the better part of the last four years, those things have helped me continue on and making like really incremental progress is like on days where you're not feeling it, like just fucking pack it in, man. Like, and I, but I think there's a, there's two sides to that coin. I think it's because for so long I was by the book that I um, almost mm -hmm. like the work is done. Like the, the foundation is there and if you still want to keep building, you need to like alter your approach a little bit because I think people hear that and then they're new and they go, oh, I'm kind of tired today. It's like, yeah, but I can parse out the difference between being tired and being fatigued. So, you know, being more intuitive with the way I train, how I train, the volume within a session, the number of sessions within a week, it's not by the book anymore. The book is fairly ingrained that sort of makes these high level decisions. You can't really get away from it. But, you know, today, for example, mm -hmm. I'm not going to train. I was supposed to, but I'm not because I feel yeah. absolute trash. So uh, the thing, I would say that's something that is relatively new. I think the thing that I probably carried with me more than anything else is exercise selection. Like I, I feel as mm -hmm. if I've done the same, I don't know, 12 exercises for 12 years, 15 years, whatever it's been. Um, that seems to be something that reigns true. And regardless of like the changing tides, especially hypertrophy training, it's so, it's so interesting when it meets, uh, when application meets theory, because with Instagram and especially with COVID, mm -hmm. I found that like so much of the theory was theory was all people had was they just sat around in their basements and they just espouse these, these, uh, summaries of research articles and people are arguing about like mechanical tension and like ah uh, oh, man that sounds really stupid for someone who's like 140 pounds <laughs> so i i think like uh yeah. exercise selection for me is always like it's just work right like everything it clearly like it, you can have a certain principle that uh, people don't abide by and they still put on muscle mass right and then you try and get into the weeds and predict some of like the negative collateral damage and the way they train like like Branch Warren is a guy that always comes to mind. Like, how does he have joints? It's like, what are we talking about here? What do you mean? How does he have joints? <laughs> what, like, do you know how joints work? <laughs> like, if, if he has seven meter knee wraps on, and he has forty inch quads, and you're worried about the speed in which he hits the hole in a hack squat machine. Like, how? Do, I don't get how he has joints. Yeah. It's like, because you're weak and he's strong. Is that a good enough answer? Um, so yeah, I think like for me, long-term exercise selection, like regardless really of, you know, the emerging science or the re-emerging really of like strength curve resistance profiles and, and, and accommodating resistance principles with bands and different cute handles and angles and shit. And I was like, okay, maybe that makes sense from an overall like load management perspective in a session if i needed to offload some resistance from a global perspective but is it doing anything in a very focal in that focal moment to stimulate the muscle any differently it's like from a net perspective probably not um so that's been something that i stayed fairly yeah. steadfast in as far as like exercise selection goes um yeah i think being really stubborn also helps and it's like, eh, nah, that sounds, that sounds stupid. I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah. But like that's, that's the thing that's important for people to hear, right? Because with the, 
kind of the abortion that social media has come with regards to training in particular, it seems that the way to like really try to get attention nowadays is I just feel like everyone's just like making up exercises just for like the pure purpose and sake of, of making up exercises. And it drives me absolutely insane. And it, it leaves all these like really dumb, pointless debates on the internet. And I'm like, what are you guys arguing over? There's literally nothing to discuss here. Right. I think the, the great example there is like, yeah, you're 135 pounds soaking wet. So like, maybe like, it's great that you read the textbook and understand what's happening on a whiteboard. But the one that gets me, I think this is a really important distinction is like, people just don't understand that if, if you're trying to drive strength, hypertrophy or power, like the thing that has to be challenged has to be load and or velocity. And if I'm going to put you in all these fancy, like stances and positions and all these other things, you're inherently challenging the position and not challenging load or velocity. That's not to say there's not a time and place for those things someplace in a program to keep you moving well, feeling good to like manage that whole side of the coin. Cause it's important, but like, don't talk about those items as being things that are going to actually help you put on legitimate muscle mass and get really strong or be really powerful because they're, they're just not going to do it. But people are trying to carry those exercises over into this realm. And I'm like, you guys are kind of just wasting your time. I quit. You're kind of just like banging your face against a brick wall repeatedly and expecting a different outcome. Mm. Yeah, I think we both come at it. My business partner kind of like said this in passing the other day. He's like, oh, yeah, but you're assuming that people want to get better. Is like, don't, don't assume that. Like people just want to, people just want to be right. They don't want to be better. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you can ask my ex-wife, like I love being right. But at a certain <laughs> point, it's like you got to get better and abandon the stuff that doesn't work. But yeah, it's, it's funny. The exercise one, it always makes me laugh about just identifying because people do so much, especially people that are trying new exercises, the people who will try everything or who people who try anything have tried everything. Right. So it's like, I always mm -hmm. make the comparison. You're a basketball, you're a basketball guy. Yeah. I'll follow yeah. Basketball. So like, I always make the comparison of like, you know, the 2013 Miami heat and like comparing, like trying to compare the stat line or say like without without question that what's his name like michael miller was the reason they won it's like what <laughs> what like, are you serious like like uh, i mean I'll, I'll make it easy with like glute training like i look at the hip thrust and I, there's some benefit to it probably not in the way that it often gets applied but it's like it's the michael miller of exercises it's like you you, <laughs> you got your big three up front like no one's being like god oh, man remember that Miller, it's like, oh yeah, I'm sure D Wade and yeah. and Bosch and Braun Braun had nothing to do with it. I'm sure squat, lunging, nothing. and deadlifting had nothing to do with it. Let's argue about the plus <laughs> minus of Michael Miller. It's like most people don't even know who the fuck that is or whatever. Like so it's just it's so funny when people are just unable to accept or identify what it but I guess to I don't know, to a broader perspective, I guess people just need something to like believe in. Because I think it's the belief that drives the consistency that if everything works and nothing works every time, the majority of people aren't going to have like, I don't even think mental fortitude is the right word. Most people aren't going to be as like on a spectrum enough to be like, I'm going to do the same 12 things six days a week for 15 years. Yeah. It's like, and like, I'm totally okay with that because monotony is such a comforting feeling for me. So I love that. But if you need to, and if only mm -hmm. people recognized or admitted that that was the real science behind what they what they were doing, it's like I've created a system or something that's really just going to get you to go into the gym more often. Like you go for the hip thrust, but you stay. Yeah. It's just going to make you be consistent. And that's it. But it's like just be honest <laughs> with people. Like I I understand. Like that is probably like the need for people to believe in something is the prevailing science in in hypertrophy training or really strength training, weight training in general that no one wants to talk about because no one wants to admit that their system is flawed and that humans are flawed. And in a weird yeah. way, those two flaws seem to meet together and then they can both move forward into the future and make progress. So it's just, I don't know, man, people are silly. People are strange. And again, I'm no different. And I, I have a system and a logic of like a internal logical consistency to the way I make decisions around training that I look forward to. And I don't know, maybe 10 years, maybe five years, maybe tomorrow, figuring out is all wrong. But 
at the end of the day, <laughs> it was enough for me to be like, hmm, that machine isn't being used. Do I sit around and wait? Well, I'm going to go into like my Rolodex of how I think about exercises and just pick a quick substitution and just keep going. And then that has, yeah. that has led me to compound more reps and more sets or, rather than just sitting there being like, oh, God, do you, how many sets do you have left? Right. So it's, or like, oh my God, that the gym doesn't have a leg press with a 35 degree angle. I need to, I need the 1987 Nebula leg press. I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's kind of a, an inability to really focus on the rocks. I think everybody loves pebbles and sand. And maybe it is just a, a human nature thing of we have ADD and we love shiny objects and we just want to like, ooh, piece of candy ourselves to death. Um, because we just get bored, you know, like maybe, maybe that's what it is. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of like our job as coaches is like, you gotta, you give them like the little candy, but then like we, we make sure that we have the things in there that we know they're going to need consistent exposure to, to actually like get the change in adaptation that we want. Um, cause if like, if left on their own, like they're just going to change it all the time and then they work their ass off for like three to six months and they've gotten pretty much nowhere. Yeah. It's always like the way my mom used to get me to eat vegetables. Like she just grind them off in my spaghetti sauce. So like, that's kind of the same idea with like people. And, but also too, <laughs> like, I think it speaks yeah. a lot to the landscape of what draws people into training. Like we could sit and have like this nostalgic laugh about T nation and, and Paula Quinn and, and West side and elite FTS and, and say what they are, say what they've oh, evolved yeah. into now some some good some bad some unchanged for the better or worse but it, that was a medium that demanded your attention like you were in forums trying to not get kidnapped by some weirdo guy but also trying to improve your bench press <laughs> like uh, this guy's probably yeah. got like a mattress in the back of like a windowless van but he looks like he's got big triceps so i'm gonna roll the dice on this <laughs> and, yeah More so thing. like you you come out to the other side and someone sends you a link to this website and you end up on it and you're just like oh and it's like you had to have a long attention span to go through like the the journey to mount doom and this weird mordor frodo baggins journey to find this well now it's like everyone's got instagram and they just sit like i i mm -hmm. fundamentally don't understand how social media platforms work anymore and like not to get too deep into it but like i i just i posted a reel yesterday on instagram and i like i had to get my i was like Tess, can you i don't i didn't even know how to like post it or put it together and then i'm looking at some of these numbers i'm like this is insane like there's no way that's real like there's no way that that amount of people are sitting mm -hmm. there but then sure enough i'm like i started to notice in public i was on like the metro train here in in dubai and i was like just looking at everyone on the phone i was like oh they're all just scrolling into infinite space and one of them will probably two of yeah. them three of them might be on some sort of fitness thing but if, if, if that's if that's your vetting process of your attention to go into an endeavor like weight training it's like that those two things don't meet the means in which you find it and the demands of the task that you just found. It's just not, it's short attention span does not find you well, like being on some sort of honestly, like some sort of Asperger's spectrum is like such a gift. If you want to get into like resistance training, like you talk to people who are like yeah. very smart, very athletic. Like I always think of like Kobe Bryant, like the guy was you know, he was in the gym at three. He was in the gym at nine. He was in the gym at noon. It was like you—you you got to be kind of like you know. There's a chromosome that's doing fucking jumping jacks or something. Like you're not right in the head. You got to be a little. I think off. so. Yeah, like, but it, and the hard part is, it's like how, like yeah. you said, like how do you how do you drive? How do you keep that interest? It's like okay, you got to string that that shiny red ball in front of them, and then it's the old bait and switch. And then it's like, isn't this? Well, didn't we do this last week? It's like shh. <laughs> There, 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 there. Don't right. tell yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting, man. It's like I don't know. The more you deal with people, the more you realize, like, man, we are messy, messy creatures. Especially, I think the social media one's interesting because it's the attention span continues to get shorter and shorter, right? And it's like the length at which you're allowed to like post things on social media now, it just keeps getting like shorter, 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 and shrunk down. It's like now it needs to be under a minute. 
because a reel can't go longer in a minute. And like you have to be under a minute because, you know, TikTok is getting really popular and big. And so a reel is just trying to copy what's going on on TikTok. And it's like you're playing this thing. And I'm like, I don't know what kind of value I can reasonably bring you in under one minute. It's like I can probably give you a tip on one exercise that's going to help with one thing. Right. As opposed to if you think back to those earlier days, it's like you have to go searching for this resource and then you got to read the whole damn mm. blog post or you're like me. And it's like you really want to dig into it. So you had to figure out how do I order these old Russian manuals? I hear all these people talking about all the time, but I can't fucking find them because you can't buy them on the Internet. So it's like you're talking to super sketch people on the Internet like, hey, can you like I'll like. Western, I'll Western Union, Union yeah. you money. If, yeah, if you'll like, if you'll send me these Russian manuals translated yeah. into English, right? This is a different. It's a different. Yeah, time. and it's tough because I think part of the responsibility lies on the backs. Like, if you're in like a creator position, and, and I kind of resent the term, but I think people will understand what I mean by that. Like, if you have a business that it can be benefited by a presence on social media. I think it's understanding that the medium really is the message and understanding like your audience. Like I get, I get shit all the time from people like you talk too complicated. It's like, you're not my customer. Your coach is my customer. Mm -hmm. Like and I get it all, all the time. Like, why is this so complicated? It's like, because we're fucking evolved chimpanzees with universes for brains. Like it's not your job to understand it. You hire someone that I talk to, to understand it and then give you reps and sets. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, for Instagram, it's like, oh man, what do I do? It's like, I'll, I'll put a few longer wordy things in there, but it's like, Hey, here's a picture of my dog. And then Instagram's like, Oh my God, I love dogs. It's like, yeah, me too. Uh, I knew, and I thought yeah. you would. Uh, you can't right. go wrong with dogs. You can't then, go wrong. Uh, but isn't that like, that's why I love the podcast, right? Cause you want to talk about exclusion criteria. Like if someone's interested in what we're doing, like me and you, they'll sit, if they'll sit through all this, God bless your soul. If you made it this far, hi mom. But it's like they're going to be down with what we're doing. So I, I think it's like people mm -hmm. and I was – I literally remember the first – Instagram had actually just expanded its video capability on a story post to a minute. like Or not a story post. Sorry. Stories weren't even a thing back in the day. Um, just like a feed post video could be a minute. And I tried to do some sort of video on like core training or something like that. And I, it kind of went pseudo viral because I talk, I mean, I talk fast when I don't, I'm in no rush, but I had 60 seconds to say everything I thought I knew about core training. <laughs> and it was literally like, I was just auctioning people ideas. I was just going so, and everyone, like no one was commenting on the actual, like, co like content itself. They're like, hey, get a load of this guy. Get a, get a load of how fast this guy's talking. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, oh, okay. Like if I want to <laughs> talk about things. I need to have a longer form and then the podcast. And then if I want to do things more like infotainment, then it's like, okay, I got to be on YouTube. It's like, all right, if I just want like, you know, broad spectrum, wide net, like more notoriety, okay, I need to be on Instagram. So it's like understanding what, because there's, there's three totally different audiences. And you almost like know, like if someone's yeah. walking, like for whatever reason, whenever I'm in airports, it's always people that listen to the podcast. And I've noticed this. Like whenever I'm in gyms, it's people that follow me on Instagram. And, you know, maybe it's, there's a mix of like YouTube in there, although I don't pay much attention to it. But I can tell. Like if someone's like kind of walking up, like, okay. And it doesn't happen often. I'm not like – but when it does happen, I can tell by just like the look of someone. Like, okay, this person listens to the podcast. Or if I like, okay, this guy <laughs> follows me on Instagram. Like that's, that's their point of entry. And it, and it's valuable to know that because it's like, you can put out whatever you want, but it's how you're perceived on the other end, really from a business perspective that matters. So I think it's something that parsing mm -hmm. out the different ecosystems on social media platforms from a business perspective has been like infinitely interesting. Like it has been such a, yeah. like, I feel like Jane Goodall. And these are just a bunch of chimps in different environments. Like it's over so dead. I'm just sitting there like taking notes. Like hmm. he approached timidly at the, like at that E45 gate. <laughs> so I would love to know that like these, the podcasts are always so hard because like the question asking aspect of it, you know, it's like, you don't want to be a jackass and ask questions that are too broad, but at the same time, you don't want to ask questions that are like super, super hyper specific. And so 
something I am curious about knowing is, you know, you start off more in this hypertrophy bodybuilding realm with a big interest. You eventually get in and start competing in powerlifting. How did you like to manage those two worlds in terms of bodybuilding and powerlifting? Because obviously each of them are their own yeah. sports. But I think you're getting more and more athletes now who are actually blending the two and blending the two incredibly successfully. It makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of carry over there, right? But I would, I'd be curious to kind of hear your take on that with yeah, your Yeah, I think they inadvertently do a pretty good job in sort of like macro periodization for both sports. So the other has mechanisms that the other needs. Um, and without having to really go too deep into some sort of concurrent training model, you can kind of run them um, in series of one another rather than sort of trying to overlap in a parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, Stan Efferding is probably the goat when it comes to this, right? And I, I had Stan on a podcast. I don't know, maybe three, four. Actually, when Pat was in town, Stan actually came to the seminars. You want know, to talk about pressure. Stan next to Pat Davidson and trying to tell yep. something that Stan Efferding doesn't know. It's like, I'm just going to get, I'm going to go get coffee. Does anyone want coffee? I'm going to go get coffee. There's no point of me being here. Yeah. <laughs> As a random aside, that dude is so nice. We had him on the nice. podcast a nice. couple of weeks ago. It was the first time I met him. I was like, yo, Best. you're so nice. Like, we were just texting the other day. He sent me a video of like one of his daughters crushing it on a, like an overspeed treadmill. And I was like, Dude, you're just like, yeah, I just want to come hang out with he's, you. <laughs> like, you're he's just, like a big a brother and dad at the same time. He's done everything. He's seen everything. He's, yeah. But I remember just walking through Wynwood with Stan and him telling me about how he thought that his, you know, his periodization of always going bodybuilding, powerlifting, bodybuilding, powerlifting helped keep him, you know, continually putting on muscle, but also helped maybe bypass some of the uh, downfalls that just going hyper-specific into one of these strength sport disciplines, uh, you know, one of the, the downfalls that carry w or mm -hmm. come with going in, into one of these bodybuilding or, or powerlifting specifically. So I, I think for me, like never really stepping on stage, always just being more of like a gym bro, it was a little bit easier, especially under the tutelage of Dan Green. Like you just do what you're told and you sit down and you shut up and no one talks, and everyone just goes on their phone after sets. But I think it was good because, you know, loading at as hopefully as close to max as you can, some of these, like, or the squat bench and dead, they, they might not give you a ton of information about, you know, individual joint movements or something like that. But at maximal load, it's like, you're going to figure out real quick if all your dogs are barking, right? And then if they're not, you're going to have to then go through and dissect why does my knee hurt why does my hip hurt why do my back hurt outside of like the obvious you know load management issues that could come in prepping for a sport like that so i feel like that kind of that peels back a layer of the onion that you never really get exposed to at the relative intensities and like the the common training modalities that bodybuilders use you don't if you're on a leg press all the time you might not ever succumb mm -hmm. to any sort of um, negative consequence of loading through like an asymmetry of the pelvis or anything like that. It's externally stabilized to the nth degree. You have so much reference that your body can fill in these gaps for you and you can sort of yeah. auto correct between where your feet are on the giant steel plate and your back is on the giant throne that you're sitting in. Everything sort of self corrects. Um, so that can be tough because when you have bodybuilders that are purely bodybuilding and don't get under barbells or don't put, um, barbells in their hands this doesn't become readily apparent until it's we're pretty far advanced in these in these movement biases so then it's like well your elbow issue you probably would have figured that out really quick and you probably would have had shoulder pain or elbow pain at 75 percent of a max but you've been sitting on a plate loaded prime machine overloading the fully shortened position or whatever the fuck for like the last eight months so you have you weren't giving yourself a window into mm -hmm. the actual underlying like function of the shoulder, insert shoulder, hip, pelvis, rib cage, the scapula, whatever, because you didn't you didn't have that specific demand on it. So I think oscillating or undulating between these two training styles kind of sets you up. Like powerlifting is going to expose. I mean, not to oversimplify it, but like it's going to expose your imbalances per se. And then if you want to keep getting stronger, you might want to sort that shit out. Or you might want to learn how to manage load. But if you come out the other end of it 
and you're really strong, all of your sub-maximal work now is increased in its its potential resistance. So then you can kind of go off and do higher volume training and, and you know, maybe do like, uh, and this isn't being like disparaging, but like a lot of times people's inability to get stronger, especially at heavier weight classes, is like they have no work capacity. So, you know, and, but not just like, cause I yeah. think bodybuilding training and bodybuilding are different. And I think the reason that Stan got so much benefit from it is in order to actually be on stage in a bodybuilder, I'm sorry, at a certain point, you're going to have to do cardio. Like, I don't know anyone who's successfully done or done well, at least the level that Stan has or better, excuse me, who hasn't done cardio, but you see these power lifters who they're joking, but they're kind of mm-hmm. not that eight reps is cardio. It's like eight reps should never be cardio. If eight reps is cardio, you're not as strong as you could be. If that, yeah. if that out, or if, uh, like if that, um, if that output is taxing to you, or you're tapping into that energy system so early, that's actually what's bottlenecking your strength. So to really take the bodybuilding pursuit to a point yeah. where you're, you know, maybe it's moderate of like thirty minutes, five times a week, or something like that, leading into a show, which is, you know, I think with maybe it's drugs, maybe it's maybe it's better science. I don't know, but bodybuilding has seemed to move away from slightly the two hours twice a day cardio of like the late eighties, early nineties bodybuilding. However, it's like, if you're looking at concurrently training or in series training, these, these two sub disciplines, I think the one thing that the power builder misses in the conventional power building program, and that potentially makes it difficult to run them concurrently is the cardio aspect needed in true bodybuilding. Um, and I think that really is the linchpin that, that successfully links those two training styles together, that it's the hardest part. So that's why no one does it. So I think that is, if we're going to look at bodybuilding yeah. and powerlifting training, it's one thing to be like, I'm going to lift two by two and I am a powerlifter, or I'm going to lift three by eight and I am a bodybuilder. It's like, Maybe, but if you're actually a bodybuilder, you're going to lift three by eight and then you're going to go on the Stairmaster for 40 minutes. And it's that part of bodybuilding that I think people mm-hmm. don't really go. And when, when we meld them together in power building gym bros type things, it's that card, it's that cardio that I think um, gets missed. And that is the key to uh, how both of those two things are complementary. Yeah, we've. We've talked on a handful of episodes at length about the, like the work capacity issue that essentially creates the ceiling for a lot of these people, right? Because it's just, it not only limits your capacity within a given session to train at high enough volumes, but it also just totally hinders your capacity to recover between sessions. It's like an intra and intercession limiter, right? It's like, you don't need to be able to go run a, run a 5k or do anything along those lines. But it's like, if, like, if we see somebody and like, you got a resting heart rate of like 80 something and like we ask you to do anything over eight reps and you're <laughs> and you're like panting and like walking your way around the gym, you know, it's like, bro, like you could be super strong, but like you're not going to be able to actually push it the way that you need to in these different domains to like get past where you currently are. Right. You can get crazy, stupid, strong before you like start running into this being, a, a, I think like a really, really significant issue for you. Right. Um, but at a certain point in time, like you need the requisite work capacity so you can train at the volumes that you need to train at so that you can actually continue to improve strength and depending on the weight class. And if you're trying to manage that appropriately, right? Like the amount of muscle yeah. mass. And I training. think, but yeah, it's like, I think pretty much everybody unanimously, unanimously across the board will benefit from like low level, call it zone two, call it actually like wrote something about this today. You have, you have four independent parties that essentially all came to the same basic heart rate range for this like low intensity conditioning, right? It's like Joel Jameson, 130, 150 beats per minute. Um, block periodization is looking like 140 to 160 beats per minute with Isarin. And then Selyanov and the heart is not a machine. He's more like 110 to 150 beats per minute. And then you have some other guy talks about this maximal aerobic heart rate method and that puts you about sub 150. So like, all four of these people are intersecting somewhere in 135 to 145 beats per minute. So spending like 30 to 45 minutes there a few times a week is not going to ruin your gains. Like it's, it's yeah. going to help you in the long run. I think that's, a, that's the key, right? The long run you're especially now with the, 
you know, like yeah. I, I look at powerlifting and just realize how how dependent powerlifting was on the actual competition. Right? Like powerlifting really took a, a nosedive if you couldn't see people on a platform. Like it it is fundamentally different than seeing someone squat heavy in a gym than show up on the day and I kind of do what's necessary um, to compete against someone else in a weight class. But the one thing that is, it's almost like I look at long-term periodization for powerlifters, at least the ones at the, like the very top, like the way, like a, a an elongated periodization cycle for off-season CrossFitters. It's most of these guys and girls came in with a very strong aerobic base, right? They came like Kevin Oak is a guy that comes to mind, like an absolute mutant of a human being. But he was a Villanova track star, right? So it's like the likelihood. So it's as if this uh, this base of work capacity across his lifespan was like something he was really good at. And his, like, let's just say somewhere along the line, Kevin Oak will do his last powerlifting meet. Will the performance of at his last powerlifting meet be met at a point where his cardiac output is declined so much that that's his bottom line? Probably not. Right, it's it's probably always going to be more than what the mm-hmm. sport demands, and won't be where he needs to focus a lot of his attention on. In the same way that, like, you know, my business partner is a really good Olympic weightlifter, so coming out of a CrossFit competition, moving into an off-season training cycle, didn't really have to do that much ollie work. And even if his snatch and clean and jerk started to deteriorate a little bit, he's probably still going to be top of the pack, and he's going to be better collectively if he spends some time on. Yeah. I don't know, gymnastics or, or long distance running or something like that. Right. So that'll, that'll have a, a, a higher, that's a higher yield, like weighted variable against the final outcome, because there's so many different systems that play at a, at a sport like, or in a sport like CrossFit, where it's like all of the good ones. And the hard part is we never see them do it now, but we never gave a shit about what they were doing before. And they all come with this. And it's the same with like, you know, they, they yeah. maybe, maybe they're football players. They come with a football background. Uh, Dan Green, uh, little known fact, and I love to put him on blast every chance I get, is used to be a male cheerleader at the University of Michigan. So, like, everyone's sitting there like, man, this guy's rotator cuff. It's like, fuck a kettlebell, man. This guy used to hold people on his, humans, beings. Humans. Uh, yeah. He's hold 160 <laughs> so pounds. So it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah Dan, never, Dan never does shoulder rehab stuff. It's like, yeah, he preemptively struck all that. Like proprioception, overhead position, like my man's good. Like he spent most of his life just like literally picking up chicks. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's people don't, they only see like through this paper towel roll lens at what they're doing now. And then they base all their decisions where it's like, sorry, man. Like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta start from go collect $200 and move around the board just like everyone else. <laughs> Yeah, you got to pay attention to what's been going on for the last, you know, yeah. 8, 12, 15 years of this person's life. Uh, it matters so. quite significantly. Especially, like, we don't need to go down that path. But, like, when you start looking at like, the structure of the heart and other things like that, it's like the, the things you're doing when you're 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, they matter in a really significant way when you get to be, like, 25, 28, 30, 32. It's like, it, this all compounds, you know? And I think that's a perfect point. Like, you... Yeah, people love to do this, right? You see somebody in like a split shot of right now. It's like, oh, it must be nice. I can't stand that. I hate when people say must be nice. It's like, oh yeah, it must be nice. You missed the other 15 fucking years that this person had to like dedicate themselves to get to the point they're at now. You just see like this result. You don't see everything that took place before it to actually get them there. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That I mean, that, like, it, 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 and that it always says more about the person who says it than the person they're saying it about. So I'm just like, all right, whatever. Like I, and then this is like it's kind of the cool part because mm-hmm. I like I never would have gave a shit about like looking into human behavior or like, call it psychology, call it philosophy. But it's interesting that the conduit into starting to pay attention to these things has been like working out because it's like you dive so much into like the science and the application and you do the same shit forever and then you eat the dumb food and you buy the protein powder and you do whatever other crazy shit I've gotten up to. And you get to the end of it, you're like, hmm, what else is there to do? And then you start people watching in the gym. Like, oh, like I wonder why he's doing that. <laughs> I wonder if I wonder if he has kids. I hope he doesn't have kids. That was pretty dumb. 
like what drives people, what motivates people, it really what does. Mo- like what motivates a bodybuilder to do what it's necessary to be a bodybuilder, but also what motivates someone to like chat shit in your comment section. Like what, what is the motivation behind that? Like I find that so much, like I'm at a point now where I find that so much more fascinating than strength curves and resistance profiles or like myostatin inhibitors or whatever the fuck. I'm like, Hmm. Yeah. That's a really weird thing to say. Did your mother not hug you as a child? Like what, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I think that we'll, we'll wrap this here in one second. I mean, I think that, I think like from my experiences is like, I think like the, the, the more and more you dive down into the weeds, into the realm of what we do, the more you start to come back out and realize that you kind of have these core basics and foundations. And these are the things that everyone's been doing for quite some time now. Like we haven't reinvented the wheel. We maybe put a little bit of icing on it and some sprinkles here and there, but like the big rocks really have not changed over time. We may package them in different ways. We may put fancy names on them and call them different things. But at the end of the day, you have these core big things. They have worked. They work today and they will continue to work in the future, despite like all the noise and everything that comes around from them, you know? Um, and that's just one of the things I think sometimes yeah. people just get totally lost in that conversation is like, they, they get so lost in the weeds. They can't realize you got to be able to see the forest, I, right? Let's zoom in and out. I think the biggest big thing picture is of, okay, you got to realize one of the things that are going to really move the needle and then I can play around with this other stuff as much as I need to maybe, in, but like we can't ever really take like the big I've stuff I've out. Lost you completely. So I'm going to, okay, there you go. Hello. Um, I feel like the big like thing that people got to realize is that you're never in the biomechanics business. You're never in the strength and conditioning business. We all work in the people business. Like we're all hospitality and management. Like that's really what this whole thing is. And the quicker you realize, because people realize that with no skills and it bugs the fuck out of us, right? We, we see people like this guy is a guru and he's at, (laughs) at guru guy bicep 12 and he's a holistic functional trainer and you're like yo but he's figured out something that you have not yet my Uh friend like he's figured out that he's in the people business and he knows his people and his business is a reflection of that so it can be so frustrating like on the other side of it to sit there and be like how is this guy like able to feed his family he's like because he understands the biggest rock which is like it's it's we're all in the people (laughs) business and a lot of times the harder you lean into and and cling to the science the less personable you become and that has a negative effect and and it has a negative effect on why you got into it for most people anyways in the first place it's like you want to work with people it's like hey be a person that people want to work with like then yeah i don't know rate of force development whatever the fuck no one cares <laughs> like no one, like frankly other than like me and you like no one gives a shit but it's you know i think that's like that's yeah. <laughs> the more you can realize that people are working with you for who you are, not what you know. I think the the better off you'll be in this business for the long term. One hundred percent. I'll I'll just make one little snippet there, and then we'll wrap this sucker up. I I remember kind of having that because I like just started my career, and I was so just like in the weeds on like sets and reps and strength and conditioning and was going so hard there. Then finally someone pulled me aside. It's like, bro, just remember to be like a fucking human being and have a conversation. They don't care. Like if they walk out of this room with an arm pump and they sweat, they're going to be ecstatic. They're going to be so happy about the session they came into. And then I remember having a physical therapist, one of my early mentors tell me, he's like, James, did you know that um, people's result in PT a lot of times comes down to whether or not they just like their therapist or not. He was like, you can look at the outcomes of physical therapy. This is actually documented research. He's like, people that had positive outcomes, they just liked their PT. And a lot of times the people that had no outcome, just they just did not like the PT because they weren't personable. They weren't friendly. They didn't get along well. So right. yeah, at the end of the day, like we are in the human business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's... Impossible to go past that. Oh, <laughs> it's crazy. It is wild, dude. But Jordan, man, thank you so much for coming on, dude. I really enjoyed this. For people that want to <laughs> find you, where can they go to, uh, to yeah, hear more Instagram's about Yeah, Instagram's probably the, the, the easiest keyhole to look through. Uh, it's at the underscore muscle underscore doc. Uh, anything on the education side is www.pre-script.com. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever wants to rap or anything. Shoot me an email, jordan at the muscle doc.com. Uh, but that's it. Give you my home address if you want. I live at 
one Duja tower in on Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai. Stop by any time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people are buying flights as we speak. Oh, man, what a riot that would be if somebody actually showed up in Dubai. Uh, Well, thank you again, and uh, thank you as always for tuning in, peeps. You guys have a fantastic rest of your week.